This is Future Builders Podcast, and I'm your host, Teemu Vuotila. I'm an enthusiastic future explorer working with a Finnish tech company. Together with my guests, we are building the future today. Are you in? This is Future Builders Podcast with Robert Nemlander, former astronaut candidate and co-founder of Endocube, the Nordic leader in insect farming technologies and insect foods. Together with him, we'll be finding out how can we create sustainable nutrition in the future, how to feed Earth and Mars, how to be the change you want to see in the world. So, Robert, you're a civil engineer, a co-founder of Endocube, and a former astronaut candidate, or how was it? Yeah, yeah. So, so my journey into entrepreneurship and founding Entercube started off with my childhood passion to be an astronaut. Yeah. So, so I became a civil engineer, I did some work in the field, but back in 2012 I heard about this international astronaut uh, program called Mars One, and they had the objective of going to Mars in the 2020s, 2030s. Yeah. So I applied, I uh, did some voluntary work as a civil engineer for them, uh, building our, or rather designing uh, infrastructure and buildings on Mars. Uh, I got selected, uh, but I withdrew my application later on. But but during that whole process of kind of getting myself familiar with all things space, Mars, yeah. uh, I realized that there's two key challenges in going to Mars in the near future. Uh, one is landing on the surface. And Elon Musk and SpaceX is kind of tackling that yeah, head on. They are focusing on that, yeah. And they're they're making strides right now. So I'm yeah. really excited about what the progress they have they've been making. Uh, the second is uh, sustainable food production. So once you go there for for decades or even permanently, you can bring your food from Earth. It's too expensive, and you have to figure out a way to produce your own food right there on the red planet yeah, on Mars. You would need to terraform it or, and, and something like that. Well, terraforming, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, that's going to take centuries, if not thousands of years. Uh, but if you're going to produce your own food there in the next few decades, you can do that in uh, environmentally controlled habitats, yeah. biodomes. Yeah. Or then the other thing is you can go underground into natural lava tubes, yeah. pressurize those. So you have the warmth and the... Yeah. Yeah. You can imagine, for example, in Finland, we have a lot of uh, nuclear shelters yeah. down below. So it's the same technology, but implemented on another planet, Andres, essentially. Yeah. But but realizing that the sustainable food production part is a key challenge, uh, there was a lot of discussion that uh, edible insects are actually the missing component in uh, designing this closed-loop food system yeah. that recycles all the nutrients. And so... Realizing that, I, I withdrew from the program and I started looking around here in my local community yeah. and around the world that, is this being done already? So so is this a new thing? And it, it turned out that it's really not. Yeah, We've been eating you know insects for thousands of years. The key challenge right now to scale it up here and make it a mainstream thing, really, yeah. is the insect farming technologies. Yeah. So those are non-existent right now. So the traditional way of collecting insects and eating the insects, for example, in Southeast Asia, Africa, yeah. Latin America. Yeah, you put them on a frying pan and yeah. eat them. Yeah. But you collect them from nature. So you go through the net, yeah. into fields, or pick it up from trees. But that's not really the scalable way of eating them. So yeah. farming methods, that's the key thing. And that's how we founded Entercube, okay. to solve that bottleneck in this this form of alternative protein. Yeah. So how's that? I'd imagine that if you try to get people to eat, or Western people, try, uh, trying to get them into eat insects, it's a mental thing. You need to overcome this mental barrier. How you find, are people more acceptable nowadays that it's okay to sort of like eat crickets and new new, new stuff? Uh, that depends on a little bit on the culture, yeah. I would say definitely. Um, Finland, for example, is a forerunner in this area. The people are really... Uh, eager to taste and experience it right now. Yeah. Uh, actually, Finland is the most insect food friendly country in the world. Okay. So so 70% of Finns yeah. consider insect food, you know, positively or neutrally, yeah. right? Uh, and it's much, the, that figure is much bigger than in, elsewhere in Europe. And even bigger 
than in Southeast Asia and uh, these traditional yeah. countries that have eaten. And that's another story why that is, but it's really interesting. We've really done something different here, something yeah. successful. And, and uh, it's happened in just a couple of years. Well, that's good. That's very fast, actually, to have this kind of transition happening. So that, oh, yeah. that's definitely a good thing. How about if um, if you looked at, you talked about the sustainability and um, scalability of this thing? So you would need to have this uh, closed system where you have the crickets, or how do you actually farm them? Yeah. So so insects are cold blooded. They need a warm environment yeah. to to have the perfect conditions for them to live. Yeah. So so temperature, humidity, CO2, all these different variables. So we started off with shipping container farms. So we insulated them, electrified them, and whatnot. Uh, since then, uh, in the past two years, we've turned to uh, retrofitting existing farm buildings and industrial halls yeah. in Finland and later on elsewhere uh, to become insect farms. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of interest in Finland from the farming side, from from, from the farming community yeah. to start this uh, insect farms because they're really struggling right now. Yeah, so, of course, because the government doesn't support them and uh, I think it's something like... Tens of farms die each year because there's no someone to take care, of, take it onwards, or, or yeah, you know. Yeah, to. absolutely. I mean, in Finland and and elsewhere, the farming community is really struggling. And in, well, in Finland, the reasons are you know, Russian, Russian sanctions, yep. uh, uh, low producer prices, but nowadays it's it's also climate change. Yeah, uh, this will be the fourth year that the the crops are going to fail. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of farms, for example, this year that are going to quit. Because yeah. of that, yeah. So crickets are not as uh, susceptible to these kind of risks, and so you know they don't care that much if it's if it's a dry summer or a wet summer. So. Exactly. And in general, I think that with climate change and farming, uh, you know, environmentally controlled agriculture is yeah. something that's going to be in- inevitable. Yeah. Because there's going to be extreme weather conditions, and w- when you uh, grow, you know, alternative proteins like uh, edible insects or just common crops. Uh, you're gonna need, you know, these greenhouses. Yeah. You're gonna need environmentally controlled spaces to to make sure you have that food source and that income source yeah. uh, for years on end. And you can predict, you know, how, how much you're gonna produce and you, that you feed everybody pretty much. Yeah. So I think that's inevitable. That's, yeah, that's, and that's a good thing because uh, I would imagine that the uh, You don't need to take care of uh, insects as much as you would need to, to take care of cows or chickens or anything like that. They run pretty much by themselves, I guess. Uh, it's not as dirty. Yeah. So that's what the feedback from farmers are. They yeah. like the the clean conditions, lab like. Yeah. Uh, so people come in with the perception that it's like insects crawling around on walls. <laughs> Flying around on your face, it's not at all. Yeah. It, it's really it's really clinical, really. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 a work in progress. So so traditional farming, it has hundreds of years, you know, behind it when it comes to technological progress. Uh, for insect farming, that has only begun the technological progress in the past few years. Yeah. But there's a lot of things on the farming tech side that we can implement. Yeah. Existing technology we can implement for insect farming, so that gives us a boost uh, to to for for fast progress. But still, it's it's a work in progress, and um, there's still work a lot of work involved, yeah. hands-on work. But we're um, trying to develop things that automate those work progress uh, work steps. Yeah. How about individuals? Uh, if I would want to have insect farm at my house, is it a, is it doable, uh, or are we not there yet? So I would have this more small cube or aquarium <laughs> that would host insects and would produce food or is this does it still require these huge uh, facilities no that's the beautiful part about edible, edible insects because they scale from small to very large systems yeah so yeah absolutely you can have your own system at home um I would personally maybe not do it because if they escape the crickets, you're gonna have a hard time, you know, catching them. They're gonna chirp you <laughs> and keep you awake. Yeah, you would need to gas the house <laughs> in order uh, to get rid of them. <laughs> there's some, uh, you know, ways to catch them, yeah. little traps, but uh, definitely for us, Intercube, we're we're aiming for the larger scale. Yeah. So so we really want to make an impact in the, you know, larger global uh, scale. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely, if you'd had this uh, localized food source, you're not dependent upon on the logistic chains and or anything like that. So you're not as big of a risk of, you know, left starving if you have these local local farms everywhere. So yeah, that's definitely a good point. But if someone would like to become an insect farm farmer in Finland, for instance, what what are the steps that they would need to take? So, uh, first of all, contact us, contact yeah. Enzo Cube. Um, uh, we have a lot of farmers who are interested. For example, in the past year, once it's become legal in Finland, we've had over 300 farmers who've yeah. contacted us with their interest of starting an innocent farm. Uh, we introduce the concept. We have a lot of farms. We walk through the steps that what's happening there. Uh, and and uh, we look at what kind of spaces they have available. Yeah. And, and for some, we build the farm for them. Some build it themselves, uh, and um, it's it's quite straightforward to get started, really. Yeah, so it's sort of like a, not that expensive to get into the farming business uh, compared to kind of traditional investments yeah. in farming. No. Yeah, so it's easier. Yeah, well, that's definitely a good thing, also, and helps the scalability of things because if you have a lower price point on what you're doing, then you know you get more people on board. Absolutely, and we really want a lot of farmers on board because that. That that's really important for vertical integration. Yeah, because for example, if, if a, some farm quits or fails for some reason, then you have other farms to kind of um, take up the slack. Yeah, and and that's really important when you're talking to food companies who really need that certain source of raw ingredients. Yeah, and and if you build these large single experimental farms and they fail, that's really bad for the industry because yeah. then the raw ingredient source is cut off yeah and and you don't want that when the industry is growing and you know yeah it uh, will stop the progress or exactly scale it down a bit and yeah. i think that's something uh that's ahead with other alternative protein sources for example yeah. laboratory meat yeah or or well algae as well electricity protein which is a yeah. really interesting uh, uh, protein source from vtt yeah in finland but But I think lab meat is still very expensive. Oh yeah, it's like million dollars a pound, pound or something like that. Crazy oh, yeah. number. So, what about the nutritional values of crickets? They're high in protein and low in carbs. How about fat source? Are they good for that? So, so there's three different types of ways you can enjoy crickets yeah. or other insects. So there's about two thousand different insect species you can eat. Yeah, and for each one you can eat them in three forms whole um, as minced meat so then you can think about like McDonald's burgers yeah. or kind of these minced meat patties or then the third type is powder dry yeah. powder for and that you can bake into bread into tortillas you know whatever yeah, you want to bake it with yeah. and and so the powder is probably what's going to be the big thing that that drives the mainstream consumption and that is in the case of crickets it's 70% protein Yeah, it has all the essential amino acids, as much iron, um, well, twice as much iron as spinach, really, and then uh, as much calcium as milk. Yeah, and then there's this really interesting conversation we always have with vegetarians. Yeah, because uh, cricket powder contains a lot of B12 vitamin, yeah. which is absent from a vegetarian yeah, diet. So vegan or vegetarian, you need to take care of B12. Yeah. yeah, 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 but it's got good fats as well and a good omega three, omega uh, six ratio. Yeah. Speaking of vegetarians and vegans, are they pro insects or not? Well, that's always a personal question. Yeah. Uh, are you a vegetarian because of the ethics yeah, or environment? Or for health reasons. Or for or health reasons. reasons. Yeah. And we've converted a lot of vegetarians and vegans yeah. uh, to eat insects. Uh, but it's always a conversation. It's always an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. It's a personal question. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 There's many, many, too many opinions on, on that matter, and uh, yeah, some are strict. But when it comes to the ethics of thing, I think it's way easier to you know accept that not uh, harming uh, uh, these sort of big cows and instead eat crickets. Mm. So it's uh, I think it's a mental thing also that you know you can much easier eat insect than a than a cow, for instance. Yeah, and speaking of ethics, I mean, for example, the double insect <coughs> industry, we have nothing to hide. So yeah. our farms are open to anybody. So so anybody's free to come see how they're grown, yeah. how, how they're you know slaughtered at the end of the day, frozen, yeah. put yeah. to sleep. And uh, 
you know, that may not be the case with traditional livestock in yeah, a lot of cases. Definitely. And a lot of mysteries and stuff like that. Yeah. So how about the, what's the Endocube's dream? What do you want to achieve in, in future? Do you have these big goals? Gear hunger? So personally, my goal with edible insects is to feed two planets. Yeah. Nothing less. Yeah. <laughs> so Earth and Mars. Yes, and let's throw the moon in there as well. <laughs> It's sort of like a pit stop. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We can do that as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. So we've worked with well, the inspiration for the whole idea of Entercube came from this yeah. astronaut experience uh, w- with the Mars One program. Um, we've worked with NASA since 2015. Uh, and then we've uh, introduced the idea of edible insects to them yeah. and taught some of their you know, astronauts and staff and also students the m- concepts of, of this thing. And now we're also trying to establish connections to ESA, yeah. so European Space yeah, Agency. Yeah. So, so that front is going forward quite nicely. And all the technologies and kind of circular economy uh, concepts and methods we develop here for commercial use, yeah. those we can implement quite directly, actually, for Mars, yeah. and perhaps on the moon. Mars, yes, because it has, you know, a it lot of gravity. gravity yeah. yeah. Moon, less gravity. Yeah. There may be some things that don't work yeah. under that gravity, but but still, a lot of concepts we can directly use. Yeah. It's really interesting. The big uh, challenge for for the moon and Mars and bringing our existing technologies there is the way there. Yeah. So the zero-G, you know, no gravity, Uh, conditions. Yeah. How does uh, have you guys done some studies with NASA, for instance? How does crickets behave in a zero g- zero gravity state for a long time? So actually, NASA has done their own experiments with a lot of different insect species back from I think the 80s and 90s. Okay. Uh, but for for sure, there needs to be done more tests. Yeah. And one of the things we're trying to uh, do with ESA, uh, and hopefully we'll get this through is to test uh, incubating insect eggs on the International Space Station. Okay. So the idea being that can we keep insect eggs frozen for six to nine months yeah, and in orbit? Develop. Because that's the amount of time that it takes from Earth to Mars. Yeah. So if we can keep the eggs there healthy, incubated, uh, then we can make sure that in the future we can take those insect eggs to Mars. Yeah, make sure that they'll produce. Yes. Yeah. That's that's definitely a good good test to have. Are there specific species of insects that uh, fare well in in outer space? Well, that uh, needs to be tested for sure. Yeah. I think the the egg tests are gonna tell us a lot what's possible. Yeah. Uh, but there's only a, like a handful of insect species that are actually farmed. Yeah. So there's two thousand, as I said, two thousand species of insects that are eaten worldwide. Yeah. But I think only about a dozen are farmed. Yeah. So you have the actual knowledge of so how you how, farm how, them. How does it behave? Yeah. How do you automate that thing and all yeah. that kind of jazz? So it's just a handful of species you have to choose yeah. from. How about the well, the ones that we had here? They are very small crickets, and then you have these huge guys and girl cr- crickets. Uh, do they require all the same uh, kind of environment, or how does it go? Do smaller crickets do with less? Uh, strict conditions and uh, grow there, or do they vary? Well, the conditions for crickets are rather similar for the different kinds of crickets. Yeah. Uh, ourselves, we rear the house cricket, yeah. which is the most typical one you find in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And I, I think it's the most delicious one as well. Yeah. Um, But then you, maybe you're thinking about grasshoppers, the bigger ones yeah. that fly. Yeah, then destroy everything. That are in the Bible, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. That's that's the concept we hear a lot. But yeah, uh, yeah the crickets are not that species. They're yeah. little ones. They're shy. They just hop. They don't fly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the different methods and technologies we use to automate and feed and water yeah. the crickets, we can use for other cricket species and also grasshoppers and to some extent other insect species that you eat. For example, mealworms, yeah. and uh, maybe maybe black soldier flies as well. Okay. But uh, the common things for all these different insect species are that you need a certain type of temperature, uh, humidity, and yeah. CO2 content, oxygen content, all, all of this. But because we rear them in controlled, environmentally controlled units, uh, we can kind of just 
you know, switch yeah, switch switch, switch the temperature and the conditions to yeah. the right yeah. ones for these species. And you said that your your vision is to have a food source for two planets. Yes. So, how many crickets that actually requires? Uh, what is what is the bang for your buck? For instance, one kilogram of crickets. Uh, how much would you need these cricket farms in order just to provide the, for Earth itself? Because we have a limited space to farm things and limited water sources. So, is it scalable? For how many billions of people we are now? I think seven billion plus people and nine billion maybe in ten, twenty years. So we're gonna hit the limit, or we have hit the limit of sustainability already. Oh yeah, I mean right now we need one and a half Earths yeah. to feed everybody. Yeah, I mean it's not sustainable. We're gonna hit a wall. It's yeah. just environmental math. It's yeah. inevitable. Uh, I mean we don't. We're realistic about this. We don't expect everybody to eat insects every single day. You know, that's not going to happen. Yeah. We're going to have a versatile diet in the future, more versatile than now. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have more options. And in the realm of alternative proteins, you will have, you know, insects as food, insects as feed. You're going to have algae. You're going to have lab meat. You're going to have plant-based meat substitutes, uh, which are, for example, in Finland, quite popular right yeah. now. You're going to have electricity, protein, and all these different things. And they're all going to add up. Yeah. Uh, A part of all that is going to be circular economy systems. So right now, about 30 to 50 percent of all global food production is just wasted. Yeah, it goes to landfills, and and uh, we can tap into that food waste source and feed it as a raw, as an input. As for an, example, yeah, for insects, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and make high quality protein from waste essentially. Yeah, and, and that's going to play a big part in the sustainability part. But already now, if you look at kind of Uh, the at the stage we are at with crickets and it's it's just early days yeah uh, we're we're more efficient than chicken for example yeah which is really interesting um, but if you look at the kind of the the really dramatic difference you have cows so that's that's the kind of the most yeah. uh, environmentally um, uh, heavy meat yeah, you can I, eat I think it's something like uh, how much was it I think one kilogram of cow meat requires Ten thousand liters of water for you know, if you look at the whole lifespan of the cow, so yeah, it's a huge amount of. I'm I might be lying. Is it twenty thousand or twenty five thousand liters per kilo? Yeah. But anyway, if you compare a cow, one kilogram of cow, yeah, and one kilogram of cricket, uh, a cricket needs about uh, five to ten times less feed, yeah, and then about one thousand five hundred to two thousand times less water. Yeah. And then it emits 100 times less emissions. Okay. And then you can also get into the realm of, you know, vertical farming yeah. and urban farming. So it uses a fraction of the land space. Yeah, so you can use your apartment complexes or whatever to build these farms. It's possible, absolutely. Yeah. How about if you look at the, this um, endocube in, in, let's say, five years or ten years of time... Uh, Do you guys see that there's a lot of there's gonna be a lot of competition with similar sources, or do you see that there will be one big supplier who can dominate the market? Let's say Amazon will buy uh, Amazon will buy you guys or something like that. Uh, we hope there's <laughs> gonna be competition, yeah. and we welcome all competition. I mean, if there is no competition, then there's something wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, but but I mean, it's early days for the industry. I think. It's very hard to tell who's going to be the winner Yeah. Uh, in the technology side, in the farming side, also in the food product side. Yeah. Um, but that's the exciting part, I think. It's, it's like the gold rush, yeah. you know? Uh, there is no education track right yeah. now to become an insect farmer or yeah. develop technology for this or food products. So all these different people from different backgrounds are coming in with an whatever they have, yeah. an experiment and... and uh, With all these fresh ideas, wild ideas, and, yeah. and it's very hard to tell where the industry is going, but that, I think that's the exciting part. Yeah, you're on the verge of the new thing. Absolutely. Re regarding the experimentation, uh, what's your success to failure rate? I mean, uh, how many failures it requires to get something right, since you are in a, doing this new, new kind of stuff, so naturally you don't know exactly what needs to be done in order to get there. So, a I lot of mistakes. <laughs> oh, a lot of mistakes. Um Yeah, I mean, for example, in the technology side, you might do 30 
prototypes before you get you know one right. Yeah. And and then you know six months later, you figure something else out. You know it's constant improvement. On the business side, you know the landscape is always changing. So there's there's a lot of you know small pivoting all the time. Yeah. When it comes to how you market, what kind of products you put out there, and and uh, yeah, it's it's constantly changing, and you have to constantly evolve and and not be, you know, uh, comfortable. Yeah. Where do you get these uh, ideas and what do you want to do? Do you have some sort of brain hub where you discuss, or do you try to apply some old ideas in order to see how it works in in your concept? Well, in our company, I mean, for example, we try to avoid uh, reinventing the wheel as, as far as possible. So we look at what everybody else has been doing and what has been done yeah. uh, and take the learning points from there. Uh, but then then it's just a lot of hard work, really. You know, fast prototyping. And I think the um, a good principle is, you know, fail often, yeah. fail fast, and fail forward. Yeah. Right. So you always advance to something. Yeah. Exactly, and and controllable failures. You know. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see, by the way, the the growth of your company? Is it? Uh, do you require a lot of human capital? So people who work with you, or can you do a lot with automation and stuff like that? Um, you mean in development work in or development in the farm? Work, yeah, development work when you're developing these technologies. Yeah, so we're a small company. We're 11 people full yeah. time. Uh, so we really have to pick and choose what we concentrate on. And there's a lot to develop in yeah. this this technology side. Um, so so we try to focus on the insect specific technologies and methods, yeah. and then outsource you know all the rest. Like I said, there's a lot of existing agricultural technologies. You can kind of add on top of the insect-specific stuff. Yeah. So we try to, you know, outsource those and, and look what's available yeah. whenever possible. Yeah. Is there something that you guys have already found a patent for, or something that you're you filed for? Oh yeah, we have multiple patents. Okay. Yes. So basically, you you could become a, a insect version of Monsanto, except a good one, <laughs> not a, not an evil corporation. <laughs> But basically, you have these certain patterns that you can protect your way of developing insects and how to make them survive. Absolutely, I mean th- that's important in yeah. today's you know capitalist system. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, regarding that, how are venture capitalists? Are they willing to get on board easily, or uh, do you need to really explain on detail level what's the goal, or do they get it right away? I think maybe venture capitalists are now more and more interested in the alternate protein market and a lot of the big companies are kind of speaking for edible insects like like for example pepsi ceo yeah. just said that they see edible insects as one of the most promising protein sources ikea is developing their insect meat balls all these big companies are on board and that brings venture capitalists on board uh, we have ourselves uh, 20 angel investors okay or institutional investors And, and and now we're actually uh, trying to gather our third external investment round. Yeah. And we will also consider VCs at this point. So. Okay. So it's going to be a conversation, uh, and and those 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 are really important to scale up. Yeah. And internationalize. Because if you look at the venture capitalists, usually they one thing they look for in the product itself is the scalability part, and then you know people behind the product. So. Mm-hmm. I can definitely see that your guys are scalable because you can apply this to small homes or big farming communities. So I would imagine that definitely rise, raises some interest. And absolutely, I mean, it's and it's a mega trend. Yeah. You know, alternative proteins. And I come back to always to the math. Yeah. You know, climate change and the way we produce our food. It's just math when you look at it. And alternative proteins are gonna be inevitable. Yeah. So so that's why it's it's a good place to invest. Yeah. Are there any areas that you wouldn't be able to do this kind of farming? Any location? Too hot? Too cold? It doesn't matter. One doesn't come to mind. Yeah. I mean that that's the perk of the whole system. You know, yeah. it's environmentally controlled. It's if it's too hot, they'll cool it down. If it's too cold, then the environment will heat it up. And uh, yeah. So basically, 
everyone could be a farmer yeah. if they would like. Yeah, to. I would say the bottleneck there would probably be the source of feed. Yeah. Because they don't grow on nothing. They yeah. don't grow on air. You have to feed them something. Yeah. So so maybe logistics and local feed sources will become. Yeah, but the basically, if they would eat the other animals' garbage and or poop, <laughs> then you would, like you said, you would have this closed system, a mm-hmm. circular one that can support this. Absolutely. And just to make sure everybody understand, I mean, there's different kinds of food waste. Yeah. So there's the good types of food waste you can get from supermarkets, for example, that are just past their expiry date. Yeah. So those you can feed to crickets, for example, and they're fine for human consumption. Yeah. But then there's the low quality food waste like sludge, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And those you feed to different kinds of insect species. And those definitely don't feed to humans. Yeah. No. They, they're, for example, black soldier flies, they eat like uh, cow manure yeah. and they're fed to fish as feed. Okay. So it's yeah, a popular thing in Norway. Right there. So there's different kinds of you know food waste sources, different kinds of insects, and different kinds of uses for the insects. Yeah. So it's a very versatile industry. How about if you look at these uh, governing bodies um, that allow this kind of thing? Uh, for instance, in the US FDA, how many hurdles would you need to get uh, get through in order to get approved to do this kind of farming over there? Uh, well, kind of the fundamental difference between the US and Europe is that In your uh, in the U.S., uh, things are allowed until they're not. Yeah. And in Europe, things are not allowed until they are allowed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so so first, our obstacle here is in the home front in the yeah. EU. So right now, it's still illegal EU-wide to farm, market, and sell insect food. Okay. But then a few countries have made their own interpretations of this old law yeah. that forbids it, and they've allowed it in their countries. Okay. So Finland is one of them. Yeah. Denmark, uh, Great Britain, uh, Netherlands, and Belgium are others, Austria okay. as well. Okay, so basically some people are on board. Oh, how yeah. Much, how much do you need uh, to do this lobbying or going into these um, European Union meetings or, or officials in order to get this through? Is it like a lot of work? to explain them a lot of work to get this done or uh... so so um, there are we have our own organizations Europe yeah. in the Europe and uh, they've been very uh, efficient in what they do and uh, next year there's going to be a bunch of insect species that are going to be approved EU wide okay so the market of 600 million people will open up okay. for us and others so yeah as you're well. prepare for that and, uh, absolutely uh, the big the big job we had to do was here in Finland. Okay. So when we started out in 2015, you know, we were in a situation where it was illegal in Finland to do what we did. Yeah. Farm and sell insects as food. And nobody had heard of it. It was <laughs> no, the legislators or people. It was really unknown. Uh, but we still pushed on anyway for 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 part reasons. And um, uh, what we did actually was this golden circle of uh, uh, facts, uh, story, and experience. Yeah. That was the way we communicated our our story and what we did to to legislators, to consumers, to all these different stakeholders. Yeah, And that's how we got the, the law through here in Finland. So that involved uh, kind of setting up the baseline of why yeah. edible insects. You know, they're nutritious, environmentally friendly, ethical. Yeah, and, and people, also create business. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and people in Finland are smart, highly educated. They understand all that. They don't yeah. deny the facts. But you can establish the baseline. But people don't eat something because it makes sense. You have yeah. to have that yeah, you positive... Have that emotional connection and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where the story part yeah. of that circle comes in. And and we wanted to, and still want absolutely to portray Ilbo Insect as this forward-looking opportunity. Yeah. Rather than backward-looking necessity, yeah. Because in a lot of cases we see elsewhere in the world, edible insect companies and other companies as well talk about climate change, hunger, world ends if we don't do something, yeah. if we don't eat insects, for example. Yeah, so and that's the, not a positive outlook. Yeah, they they base that on fear that you need to do this because otherwise you'll be dead. Or absolutely, yeah. that that's I don't think that's fruitful. Yeah. And so, so the opportunity word is kind of the key. And for example, when I co- go to schools to talk about this, I talk to the kids that 
if you want to be astronauts in the future, <laughs> perhaps, uh, you might want to try this. Yeah. You might be the first person on Mars. Or when we talk to these farmers in Finland you know, who are really struggling and, and we try to communicate that if you want to make a livelihood for yeah. your family, have a brighter future and an outlook, you might want to consider insects as an alternative you know, yeah. source of income. And gym goers, you know, it's a good source of protein yeah, as well. Yeah, good source of protein, a lot yeah. of muscle growth. <laughs> and then in that sector, the story sector, it's really important to kind of put yourself out there, uh, put some human faces behind the movement, explain why it's important to you, not yeah. just because of business, but what's the greater vision, what's yeah. the greater mission behind that thing. Uh, and authenticity, being vulnerable, is really important, I think, there as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you should accept that it's not perfect, but anyways, you know, everyone's human and uh, be realistic about that. And then the third part is the experience. I think that's really important. Yeah. Because when we started out, we really, we could tell the story, we could tell the facts, but we couldn't get people to try it out. It was illegal, right? Yeah. And when something is unknown to people, they fear it. Yeah. Uh, so so that's how we come up with the idea of serving insects as kitchen decorations yeah <laughs> and that's also people usually they want to know the reasoning behind it why like you said the why is the usually the key thing that you need to explain to people why this is and if you explain the why you will get the emotional connection to the food or whatever you're doing absolutely regarding the like you said it was illegal at the time What were the sanctions if you would be doing? I mean, would would there be huge fines, or would be would it just be a slap on the wrist type of a thing? Uh, I think the Finnish food authorities were good sports. Yeah, um, they were just doing their jobs. Yeah, uh, but kind of the thing there was that yeah, we had to get it out there for people to taste. We did events with big disclaimers saying that not intended for human consumption. That yeah. wink wink, we have a recipe yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, buy it for kitchen decoration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And we got tens of thousands of fins to try it out. We got a grassroots level movement going, and that put pressure on the authorities as well. Yeah. And that kind of gave gave us a little bit of a shield against yeah. you know you know the, the sanctions and whatnot. But I mean, in conversations with authorities and also bigger food companies, uh, there was this big po- power imbalance behind the scenes. So we were the small company trying to push this movement forward, trying to you know develop the technology, develop farming. Well, you know, get the legislation through. We were yeah. trying to do all this, uh, and the other, the big players didn't budge. Uh, so, so how we came overcome overcame that thing was we brought the conversation publicly. Yeah, and we brought it to media. So we did the events that was in the headlines. Then authorities maybe did some some kind of a move that was in the headlines. We did something else, and it was all there in the headlines. Yeah, and that uh, created awareness that gave gave us the support from grassroots level and that put the pressure on authorities to make their own interpretation yeah. of the law which came through later last year i mean that's definitely a key point i think uh, why you got it through this message because we live in an age of technology that you can reach huge amount of people with very very little effort so to speak so mm-hmm. if you try to do this back in the 80s i think no one would have heard absolutely <laughs> <Because> <laughs> so It was a question of timing, really. Yeah. The social media and the reach of media in general really helped get this yeah. through. And that's uh, one of the key, key things. Uh, if you want to get something through, in, at least in my, my point of view, you definitely need the masses behind. And once you got the masses behind, then usually the authorities will botch or change something. So that's a good good tactic that you guys used. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, the authorities, even during that period, were good sports. You know, you could really tell that maybe they didn't really want to stop it, but yeah. they they had to because <laughs> that was the law. Uh, but we cooperated and in the end they became, I think, the heroes of the story. Yeah. And, and I think we have the best edible insect legislation anywhere in the yeah. world right now. How hard was it to get the, into these big stores? Because in Finland, you know, you have these two major players and maybe third more smaller one mm-hmm. but anyways they basically dominate the market was it easy to have these kind of conversations with them or it also required a lot of work uh, once edible insects were legal it was pretty easy I mean uh, it, it was actually a competition you know who yeah. gets the products first and whatnot um, yeah but absolutely there was a big hype when it started off 
in back in uh, November 2017, and there was a lot of products in the market. All the stores wanted them. Um, yeah, maybe Lidl not so much. They, their price range is really not there yeah. just yet because it's quite expensive yeah. uh, to produce edible insects yet yeah. so far. So, so we'll get there eventually as well. So what would be, if you think about the price point, what would be sort of like a good price point that you would want to have, let's say one kilo per insect, that this would be cheaper? And once product is cheaper, naturally more people will adapt it. So do you have a certain number in mind that you would like to hit? Uh, absolutely. We can um, challenge the existing livestock yeah. industry. I, I think absolutely. It's just a matter of time. Um, the landscape is such that if you look at, for example, the cricket powder. So six months ago, uh, the price in Finland was about, I want to say, 150 to 200 euros per kilo. Yeah. Uh, but the competition from abroad, for example, in the Netherlands, it's been 60 to 80 euros per kilo. And then Thailand, where it's really cheap labor, yeah. you can get it for like uh, maybe maybe 20 to 30 euros per kilo. So that's really put a you know uh, a challenge for us to to develop our technologies and in just six months yeah. we've come down on par with for example the Netherlands and other countries in the West. Yeah. So so the technology development has been really fast. Yeah. And I think in the next I want to say two years we'll come down to the Thai cricket powder um, prices and uh, down to to challenge the livestock yeah. industry. So I would say for the powder Less than 10 euros. Yeah. So the price price decreases way way faster than let's say a pound of meat. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, th- there's so many inv- innovations. Yeah. Uh, coming every day. Good. How about if you look at these um, outside competitions, like you said, uh, to Thailand? Do people export crickets over there in Finland or other countries? Do you see that as a competition or? Uh... Absolutely, it's competition. I mean, it's globalization. Yeah. Um, Uh, yeah, I mean, if if a food player in Finland is looking at sourcing cricket powder for their food products, they look first to Finnish producers, then maybe some in the West, Canada, Netherlands, yeah. and then Thailand. So Thailand has about 20,000 cricket farms, so they have a longer history doing this. Yeah. And and because it's already warm there, they don't have to heat the spaces up, the labor is really cheap, yeah. so the, the uh, source, raw ingredient is quite cheap. So the food players who wish ever look at the price they order from Thailand. Yeah. So so that's the reality of it. Yeah. So so we really have to make sure that our you know um, uh, price point is there but also kind of the the selling points the other selling points locality yeah. you know f- finished produced uh, fed with you know yeah, non-GMO yeah, local good, good organic feeds yeah, yeah and quality. quality yeah. That's definitely a, there. Yeah, I mean, competition with with price is usually the last thing you should always compete com, compete with quality and stuff like mm-hmm. that in order to. Absolutely, get ahead. the value proposition needs to be there. Yeah, when you started uh, Endocube, uh, did you guys uh, went to these Thai farms to get familiar how they're doing stuff, or did you start just started doing locally and failed many times? I mean, one of our key team members uh, has worked in the U- United Nations developing such farms in Laos yeah. and other Southeast Asian countries. So, yeah, we were very familiar with how they do it when we started off. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, those are really simple methods they use. So so we started off with those and we've come a long way in developing from yeah. those. When you look at this, um, you have this technology that you like to license and stuff like that. If you look at the hunger level or hunger issue issue in the world, it's on a countries that are not doing so well with low income and, and stuff like that. Do you see that it's already there that you can sell this kind of technology in there or give it away or whatever in order to cure the hunger? I mean, that was... Our founding principle was ending world hunger, and our founding business model actually was that we have shipping container farms and then work with uh, uh, NGOs 
in Finland and yeah. internationally to bring the shipping container farms to refugee camps and the impoverished of the world. Yeah. And they produce then food for themselves locally. You know, teach a man to fish, right? Yeah, that, yeah. that was kind of the founding principle. Um, but uh, in 2015, it so happened that uh, the Finnish government slashed their um, funding, for development funding, about yeah. 80%. So, so we, we had to scratch that plan because the, the organizations didn't have resources to, to start new projects, let alone maybe continue some of the existing yeah. ones. So, so that was a, actually a good thing because we realized that it's, it's preferable to develop these experimental technologies here at home, close yeah. to home, and fail here and, and uh, you know, get, gather up the resources to scale up. Because you really don't want to give these experimental technologies and test yeah. things with with the, the in refugee camps, for example, yeah, if they well, you don't require have, it. Yeah, and you don't have the control of the situation. Absolutely, but it, yeah, but it, it's not a responsible way to test things. Yeah. So so that is our goal to feed everybody, including the most impoverished and vulnerable people. Uh, and I think we're getting there. We're really close. Yeah. Um, We just need to have kind of the foundation there that we can make sure it all works. We have kind of the, the resources to scale up and, and, and correct all the, the little things that may go wrong. Yeah. So you would have this sort of like a turnkey solution that you will give out to these countries and then, you know, yeah, they will absolutely. start producing. So we're working hard toward that end. Yeah. And that, of course, requires a lot of capital. So, mm. for instance, let's say you would have uh, 30 million euros in your hand. What would we be doing in a specific area where we'd use the money? Well, I would uh, jump, you know, boost our technology development so we get to our next generation farm system as fast as possible, and that would really open the doors. Yeah, uh, and that would get the price point, the quality, and all scalability. That would solve it all, and then we could, you know, uh, produce as much as we want in, in the West, and also we can pr- uh, take those to then to the developing yeah. countries. How do you see yourself as a company? Uh, do you want to license this and then create sort of like franchises all over the world in the Cube franchise? Or uh, do you want to sell the crickets and this kind of uh, insect technology only? So right now in Finland, our business model is such that, um, first of all, we either build the farms for the farmers, yeah. or we consult the farmers who built it themselves, okay? Uh, Our main business is selling then technologies to those farms yeah. that make it more efficient, take the labor out of the equation. Uh, the cricket farm network we have produces crickets and we buy it from them. We process them and then we put those crickets in our products or then uh, sell them to food companies as yeah. Run Greens. Okay. Uh, as we go international, right now the plan is to uh, build local insect farms and also sell insect farming technologies to those farms and make yeah. an intercube cricket yeah. farm and insect farm network. But then in the consumer side, work with local big food companies who have an existing brand, yeah. have an existing, you know, um, marketing, you know, arm. Yeah. So, so we can uh, so have use local that. reach. For, yes, for exactly. Commodity. So that gives us a faster way to enter the markets. Yeah. But the technology and establishing farms wherever we are is the main point for us yeah so you you had these two companies in finland that you were discussing any european companies big ones that you are discussing or have already done some deals like this tesco's carrefour's whatever i mean there's a lot of discussions always i mean they're yeah. not public yeah of course of course but still you know you have a <laughs> steady set of clients in europe also who are very interested in yeah absolutely i mean there's um, a lot of food companies are kind of on the map. They know exactly what's going on in the industry. Yeah. They're kind of just waiting for the right time to enter the market with their products that are kind of yeah. on the shelf ready for them. Uh, uh, so so I think the biggest uh, contribution we can do on the European market is kind of be the catalyst yeah. to to uh, help those big companies you know, launch their products and, and get it right. Because we have a great success story here in Finland, right? So we're the most insect food friendly country. We had this great, you know, uh, marketing approach that we can then copy to yeah, these other countries. It, yeah. We have these different products, more products than in any other market in Europe. 
so we can kind of tell that what the consumers want and what they don't want, yeah. who wants what. Um, we know how to farm them and establish a network of farms. So all these different things that come into the value chain, yeah. we can kind of uh, bring on the table for these European companies yeah. and reduce their risks and help them launch their yeah, get it products. faster. In exactly. The so we can be the catalyst there. I think that's where Entergube comes into play yeah. in the European market. Well, now you have these uh, cricket powders and uh, fully full grown crickets. What is the next step of next kind of product that you do? Cricket candies or anything like that? Uh, so we actually launched frozen crickets. Okay. So so uh, we have a big fan base who wants the whole insect, right? Yeah. So in our product, well, first of all, you should know that the, in the first years that we started off, um, the the early adopters are kind of the consumer group who we're dealing with. Yeah. And those are people who want you know, the whole insect. They want the Instagram photo, Facebook photo, show it off, talk about it, you know, yeah. eat it as a <laughs> as a experience, right? Yeah. And those are still people we cater to. Those are our fan base. Yeah. And a lot of requests came in for, for to have just the raw ingredient so they cook it at home. So we're concentrating on those kinds of products. The the whole insects, maybe the powder as raw ingredients. And then uh, products with the whole insect as well. Yeah. Then there are other companies like Fatser who are doing bread from the powder, and and all the other companies as well. And yeah. we're providing you know the raw ingredients for those. Then, how about restaurants? Are they taking these in their menus? I think I was uh, one one restaurant in Porvo a year and a half ago. Well, before this was legal, uh, the chef gave these crickets as a sort of like this last last dessert, and he said, "Well, they are." They're just for the show, but <laughs> do what you want with them and wink, wink. Mm-hmm. But how restaurant now that is legal, are they adapting this and experimenting with these kind of foods? Absolutely. I think the the hotel restaurant catering sector is our fastest growing uh, sector here in Finland. Um, ro- a lot of interest there. For example, uh, Fat Lizard restaurant in Nespo. Yeah. Uh, the crickets are its favorite dish, most popular dish. Okay. Um, then another restaurant that's serving in Helsinki is Ultima, by the celebrity chef Henry Ale. Yeah. So they have also crickets actually growing in there on site. Okay. Um, and their concept is really interesting because it's a circular economy restaurant. So they try to produce at least 50% of all food they serve in house. Okay. So they have aeroponic systems for plant crops. They have the crickets growing there, and and they have cricket dishes. So that's it's really interesting as well. So. Well, it's good that the celebrities are adapting this kind of stuff. Absolutely, and Henry Allen is one of our investors as well. Oh, okay, so he's he's on board. Yes, he's he was already from the get go, or uh, came he up? came in during the second investment round. Okay, okay, end of last year. Well, that's good that chefs also see this as a way of you know Absolutely. growing their uh, capabilities. Let's say. If you look at the, if we go back to the Mars or fly back to the Mars, uh, getting the cricket eggs in there, yes, that's a very, very key thing. And then you would say that this building these biodomes that you would host these crickets. So how much land space they would actually require in in different kind of planet in order to sustain a let's say group of ten people? Would it be a huge biodome that you would need to build over there or? You know, it's ridiculously small, the space you need to yeah. feed a small group of people with insects. Okay. And we're talking about a, a few square uh, cubic meters, a few cu- cubic meters of volume, and you can feed a lot of people. Okay. And if NASA would call you and ask you, would you go to Mars, would you, with this endocube technology? Personally or yeah. technology? Uh, both. I mean, the technology we can provide, absolutely, and uh, we're testing it right now, uh, absolutely. And uh, if I could get five minutes with Elon Musk, <laughs> we could get the job done, I'm sure. Uh, personally, I mean, th- it was a really personal struggle, that whole astronaut candidacy. I made a lot of sacrifices because of it yeah. and took me on a, on a long journey. journey. So uh, I think that part of my journey is is done yeah. and covered 
Yeah. Well, it's definitely if you have any family or any anything mm. that you would miss here, it's a how much you said six months fly over there, mm. six months back, and then they're on site for one yeah, year. I mean, yeah, and of course that's all the discussion because the Mars One program had the idea of permanently sending oh, astronauts yeah, yeah. one way there. Okay. Uh, there's good reason for that because there is no technology to take take yeah. you back right now, and it's super expensive. On the technological side and the economical side, it doesn't make sense, and I, I, I did consider that. Uh, but uh, thinking about those things and being prepared for such things, you know, changes a person. Yeah. And and it really changes. It changes your life. And I I would imagine that for pure psychological reasons, it would be a huge thing because. I don't know how many people they are planning to send there, but let's say it's ten people, mm. and you're gonna spend your next twenty <laughs> years with ten people. You're gonna go mental, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if if you look at Mars and going yeah. there, I think the technological hurdles are, you know, achievable. You, yeah. you can you can solve them uh, with time and money, uh, but the key issue is the people. Yeah. Selecting the right type of people and the right mixture of people. And making sure that they don't break down. Yeah, because that's that. I think that's the most key thing. Yeah, and you you said uh, that if you get ten minutes with Elon Musk, that would help. Mm. So, what would your pitch be to him? How would you explain that? Why this would need to be on on his uh, SpaceX program or integrated into it? I think it's the missing piece. He's uh, he requires to to um, get. Mars habit habitable. Yeah. Right? So so he's got the rocket all set. He needs the food. Yeah. And I can provide the food. Yeah. So that's definitely a good and and a good step and a very very big step if you guys ever ever reach there. So I guess you would need to go to California. <laughs> yeah. Not on his door. Actually, uh, I had a meeting set up with SpaceX yeah. mid management uh, one and a half years ago, two years ago. Um, but it so happened that a day before the meeting one of their rockets exploded on the launch pad. Ah, okay. So they had to cancel that meeting. So uh, that never happened. But yeah. but maybe in the future we'll, we'll re- rearrange a meeting. But right now we're working with NASA again and yeah. then now we're trying to work with ESA as well. How does it go? How, how easy it work with these kind of big government organizations? Because mm-hmm. uh, I've always, uh, if you look at back in, let's say, 60s and 70s, uh, NASA was extraordinary. If you look at the inventions that they did and the technology they provided back in then because of the Cold War and global situation, uh, well, now their budget is a lot, lot less. But uh, do they still operate with full capacity for third parties like yourself and uh, provide everything that you would need? I mean, they're really slow and big organizations. Yeah. And uh, you really have to know the right people to get anything you know, forward. And even so, it, it's difficult. It takes yeah. a lot of time, a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it's a marathon, I would say, rather than a sprint with these yeah. kinds of organizations. Yeah. Um, but I think the first thing is to introduce the idea, because it is really novel for them, and making like big changes of direction take a, take time. Yeah. You know, they're committed to some kind of development project, then then they go through with it. Uh, but but kind of bring this lean startup mentality there really really helps. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think we've we've found right partners in NASA, for example. Yeah. Regarding lean startup, how do you guys work as an organization? Uh, do you have very strict roles on what everyone's doing, or everyone's doing a bunch, a lot of different things? What what is required? I mean, in, in our organization, we have certain roles, and those roles comes with certain responsibilities, right? Yeah. Uh, but Th- that that's about it, really. I mean, then we all help each other out as as needed, and and to to meet our personal and our kind of departmental goals. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you and you are you work very efficiently in that way. Yeah, that way. I mean, yeah, fail fast, fail forward. That all kind of yeah. that kind of stuff is really important for us. And uh, then there's kind of these moving pieces like myself. You know, yeah. I'm kind of involved in everything. Yeah. So so I do a lot of PR. I do. You know, a lot of the farm construction and design work. So I go around Finland, with talk to farmers, look at what they have, build things with them. 
And uh, then, of course, I'm on the board of directors, so I'm involved with a lot of the strategy work. Yeah. So, so all that comes into play. And I'm trying to help wherever I can with the team. If uh, you guys go naturally promote this stuff, what are the good places that people can find you? Are they focusing on this sort of like a farm events, farming events or technology events where, where you guys are at? Uh, food events. Food events. Everything Absolutely. Really yeah. like food. For example, you know, Helsinki Night Market. Yeah. Which is, well, this week, I don't know when this is airing, but yeah. uh, again, well, another it's, it's going to be past already. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we have events every week. Yeah. So. So we were. And uh, but still heavily focused on Finland or traveling around Europe also. So our strategy for our food brand, yeah. Samu, is essentially to focus on Finland. Yeah. And then the internationalization strategy is to do with the farming technology and farming network and not yeah. so much with the food with brand. The food part, so yeah. on the food side, the consumer side, we want to work with local partners in these uh, yeah. foreign markets. Yeah. Regarding these uh, space agencies, if I think back, what about these Asian counterparts, the uh, Chinese, Indians, they have also space programs. Oh, yes. Have you been in touch with them? Are they interesting? Uh, that's an interesting thing because actually the Chinese space agency, yeah. uh, back in 2014, they they selected three taiko knots, yeah. and uh, they enclosed those three taiko knots in isolation chamber for three months, and they just gave them plant crops and a mealworm farm, and said that this is all you get to eat. Farm this in a closed loop yeah. system, so you get uh, like roots and in- inedible plant parts from the plants. You feed those to the mealworms yeah. as a feed source. Uh, then you get some mealworm poo as yeah. a fer- fertilizer, and you put it back to the plants. A yeah. closed loop system, and they did that for three months, ate whatever they could from that system, and they came out fine. Okay. So, so the Chinese have already proven that the, yeah, yeah, that system is possible yeah. in space in the space context, and uh, I think the next phase of that project is beginning this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good that they're moving onwards with that because absolutely the Chinese are are advanced in this area. Yeah. So uh, what about the Indian parts? Have you guys know what they're doing? I think they also plan to have someone mm, in space. And, uh, not the, sure about the Indians. Yeah. No, or the Japanese. Yeah. So they they are they are doing their own stuff. If you look at the, this uh, <clears throat> this cricket, uh, sort of like how long they preserve. Let's say uh, you have uh, these frozen crickets or these dried up crickets. How long can people eat them? How long they are good for? I mean, in Finland, we have these past expiration uh, expiration dates, but that's more of a guideline, <laughs> mm. not the absolute fact when they go bad. But how long do these last? I mean, in dried form, they last a long time. So just the cricket powder has a shelf life of two years. Uh, but for example, in our products with the dried crickets, uh, the the stated shelf life is shorter because of other ingredients and just to be on the conservative conservative yeah. side, uh, but it yeah it, it's a really long time. Yeah. If you look at the the future and uh, how to get the the most skeptic people on board, uh, do you see that that will happen over time, or do you see that there are those people or personalities who will never touch crickets even if it were their last option? I mean, there's always going to be skeptics. I mean, it's not realistic to have a hundred percent of people yeah. like edible insects or any food. Yeah. I mean, for example, I think that sandwich cake is a crime against humanity. You know, <laughs> I, I can't stand that, uh, and I don't drink coffee, for example. Yeah, never tasted coffee for for for, for reasons. Yeah, uh, but you can't expect everybody to like everything. Yeah, so that's fine. Yeah, we all have our different favorite foods. Uh, we. To eat different foods every day, so it's not going to be the same thing every day, yeah. and th- that's fine. We just want uh, to provide this opportunity to have insects as a in part of a diet. Yeah, uh, one time a week, maybe every other week, whatever it is, uh, provide an alternative livelihood for the farmers who are really struggling, and, and do something really great for the environment and our future. Yeah. So basically, you can do these kind of uh, hamburger patties with this. Uh, you mix the crickets with with what? Flour and water. yeah. I mean, so so you have the cricket powder, and essentially you can use uh, if you bake something, for example. Yeah. You can, that can't be 100% cricket powder. Uh, you can fortify wheat flour, for example, yeah. with the cricket powder. 
And I think you can get up to like maybe 50% cricket powder yeah. in these mixtures. Uh, the most typical one is about 20%. Yeah. Uh, and then you essentially have a protein fortification yeah. in, in, in that. Maybe it's a meatball, maybe it's a bread, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, in the products that you have on the market, the, the cricket powder content is about three, four, maybe five percent. Okay. So it's quite it's low. It's quite low, yeah. Right now, for two reasons. Uh, one being that it's super expensive right now as a raw ingredient. Yeah. Uh, for those reasons I stated, yeah. but it's growing down really fast. And the second reason is that the availability is is not there right now yeah. that much. So, for example, when we started off uh, back in November, it became legal. And a lot of food companies in Finland wanted the raw ingredient to launch their products really fast. Uh, it pretty much happened overnight. Yeah. That whole demand. And uh, before that, there was like production to tens of kilograms in that order in Finland. Yeah. But then the demand came, went up to tons. Yeah. Uh, so so that bridge uh, had to be covered by ordering from abroad. Yeah. Right. Uh, but now this year, you know, the production in Finland has gone up, and we can meet our domestic demand, and then also now look into international markets. Yeah. Well, I think the same thing happened with these uh, pullet oats and stuff like that. When they came to market, they were always out mm. because they, people couldn't uh, or the factory couldn't produce it as much. So that definitely, I think it beginning, it definitely uh, affected negatively because you always went to the store and tried to find it out that yeah, it was always out. <laughs> exactly. So you get, oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, scarcity is not a good marketing tactic yeah. in this case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you really want uh, it to be available as yeah. much as possible for people, as many people as possible to try it out. Yeah. How's your business, by the way, have been, is it steady growth or do you have this sort of spike happen when you do some technological advances or anything like that? Or mm. is, it, is the growth stable, going upwards? Uh, I think our growth is still trying to, you know, find its form. Um, we find spikes, yes, whenever, you know, new food products are launched. Yeah. And uh, I think the how the consumer market develops is kind of key for the whole entire value chain. Yeah. And us being a technology company at the end, it's really important to follow the the, the uh, consumer demand because as the consumer demand grows, there's going to be more demand for the raw ingredients, right? Yeah. The more raw ingredients there is demand for, the more farms yeah, need to be built. Yeah. And the more farms there are, the more technology we can yeah, sell. We can sell. And, and so that's super important to for us to be kind of involved in that consumer side yeah. in that way. Yeah. If you look at the uh future future of, of humanity so to speak what are the key takeaways that people should understand about the uh, insect farming and uh, the future of insects with with our ecosystem what is the absolute greatest benefit is it the nutritional value the ethical part environmental part it's the whole package yeah it's a whole package i mean we need to become sustainable in how we produce our food, especially our protein. Yeah. And insects can take us a long way there. Yeah. And, uh, well, I think we, we are about to wrap up soon, but uh, you have any last words where people can find out more, any sites where they should follow, where they should contact you if they want to become a farmer or be involved in other ways? Absolutely. I mean, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Entercube is our technology wing. Yeah. Farmers contact us. Our food brand in Finland is Samu, yeah. Samu by Intercube. So again, follow us and uh, uh, come and visit us in events. Come yeah. taste. Can people, by the way, visit your uh, factories and stuff like that? Do you yes, provide sure. that? Yeah, absolutely. So you can you can see how it's actually done because that's definitely interesting. I would be also interested to see how it actually looks in a physical yeah, form. Please come <laughs> over. Yeah, so that's please definitely welcome. a good thing. But anyways. Thanks, Robert, for coming. It definitely was a, was a good chat, and I do hope that people will try insects and apply them in their everyday or every week meals because they taste good. Once people get over the idea, they have a good nutritional values, and uh, I do agree that it's the way of the future. It's the sustainable part and how humanity can actually survive in the future. And it's already happening now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. The future is here tomorrow. 
Join the discussion on our LinkedIn page, We Are Future Builders. And listen to more Future Builders podcasts on wearefuturebuilders.com.